It is currently Sunday, July 14th, and the Kansas City Chiefs will kick off training camp on Sunday, July 21st. So leading up to training camp, I thought that it would be nice to, to do to spend some time with a primer video for some of the biggest headlines, some of the biggest storylines, some of the biggest training camp battles that we're going to um, witness take place in St. Joseph, Missouri this summer. Now, there are multiple videos for most of these headlines on the channel, even after having to delete basically my entire uh, library in order to get back on the good side of YouTube. But I think that I am hoping to add a little bit of a different take with this primer in general from the things or in addition to the things that I have said before. So let's start with offensive tackle here. Now, I have been very vocal about the fact that I think that Jawan Taylor, Kingsley Suamataia, and Wanye Morris are in a three-way battle for two starting offensive tackle spots. And I do think that that is true. I do think that these three guys will be battling it out for those two spots. I think that these three guys will be, um, someone's going to have to play left tackle, right? The Kansas City Chiefs seem to have accrued three guys that could start at right tackle. And one of them is going to have to play on the left side. But I think... I don't think I should say it. Maybe I should say it. Guys, I, I think there's a chance that we get Kingsley Sumataya on the left side and Wanye Morris on the right side. If not by week one, then some part of the way into the season. I have also said that I think Jawan Taylor is not going to have the same type of year that he had last year, and I think that's true. I think that Jawan Taylor got in a rut last year and was targeted by NFL officials. And I think we saw that play out in real time on a national stage with the Kansas City Chiefs. But even so, Jawan Taylor looks to be a solid right tackle. I think the ceiling on Wanye Morris is incredibly high on the right side. And I'm starting to buy more into the fact that Kingsley Suamataia might be a left tackle. He has an odd type of athleticism he is i don't i don't have the words for it yet but he has an odd type of athleticism in that he is not the most fluid but he he is incredibly decisive i'm not sure i have the right terms for it but that's what i see with kingsley sumataya the in the Part of this equation that will be almost as interesting, maybe maybe not almost, half as interesting. What about the backups? What are we doing with Lucas Niang? Lucas Niang is sort of in the nether realms of what it means to be an offensive tackle in the NFL. He's not an offensive guard, Lucas Niang. He's not going to be able to get leverage. Uh, he is what is often referred to as a dancing bear, and what that really means is, I have no idea how your legs hold your belly up. That's what that term really means when you dig down. And I don't think you can play offensive guard with the build that Lucas Niang has. He does have talent at the offensive tackle position. I think the best case scenario for all parties involved is that the Kansas City Chiefs find some way to trade Lucas Niang and get something for him and, and let him get somewhere where maybe he's going to get some reps because so long as Jawan Taylor, Kingsley Sumataya, and Wanya Morris are on the team, I don't see any of I don't see any way that Lucas Niang gets on the field. Behind him, so he's the clear number four guy. Ethan Driscoll is a UDFA that probably was a sixth or seventh round pick that just kind of kept falling. He has all of the tools necessary to play offensive tackle in the NFL. I don't think that he has the ability, maybe, especially on the left side, especially if you're looking at speed rushers, but I do think that he will end up 
as an offensive guard, but I look, there's a chance that he's, he's an offensive tackle in the NFL. Jason Godrick was on the team all last year. I think if anything we're developing there, probably we would have some better idea about it than we do, but Hey, uh, maybe not this type of thing happens all the time in the NFL. Uh, you have to look no further than Chiefs offensive lines of the past for guys who spent a year bouncing around maybe on the practice squad or between teams and ended up starting at tackle. Griffin McDowell is an interesting prospect from Tennessee Chattanooga, uh, a UDFA this season. I'm going to be very honest with you. All that I know about Griffin McDowell, I know through scouting reports. I know very little from from first eye or firsthand uh, watching him or assessing things on my own. Uh, what I like to try to do if, if I have the presence of mind when looking at a new player is watch tape first and then say, okay, these are the things I'm sort of seeing. Is this corroborated? But um, I have no idea with Griffin McDowell. He's a guy that people seemed to like and seemed to think would be a UDFA, which he was, and would have the chance to earn his way onto a roster, is yet to be seen. Obviously, from offensive tackle, we're going to go to wide receiver, but where things might be a little bit different in this video from where I have talked about this in the past, I want to look at the tiers of these wide receivers, not T-E-A-R-S, although I think that's where Sky Moore might be heading. The top tier of these wide receivers looks to me to be Hollywood Brown, who is a legitimate, solidified wide receiver in the NFL. Rashi Rice, who proved himself last year to be a legitimate wide receiver in the NFL. And Xavier Worthy, who has not proven anything yet. But I think that the Kansas City Chiefs are absolutely going to give him, are going to allot him, the opportunity to be a number one, two, or three wide receiver in the NFL. They're going to give him the reps. They're going to give him the targets. They're going to give him his own sub packages. So those are the top three guys. After that, that next tier. So th those three guys absolutely on the roster. 100% all three of those guys are on the roster. I don't think anybody is going to argue about that. The only exception there is that Rashi Rice will probably find himself on the uh, commissioner's exempt list for a few weeks, which will open a roster spot for the Kansas City Chiefs, where maybe they will be able to finish or figure out some of this le later stage wide receiver depth. But after that, I think absolutely Justin Watson and Nicole Hardman are on the team. Why? They have very high floors. They especially have very high floors for the Kansas City Chiefs. Justin Watson is not a number one or number two wide receiver. Not at all. Justin Watson is a bad number three wide receiver. But when you go one spot lower on the depth chart, as a number four wide receiver, as a number five wide receiver, Justin Watson's really high quality. McCole Hardman, we know what we have in McCole Hardman. He's going to get yelled at by Patrick Mahomes a couple times a game. He's going to give what appears to be a less than optimal effort on a couple plays a game. But he's going to get you some yards. He's a guy that can be pretty legitimately a four 500 yard guy. You can count on him for that so long as he gets the reps and the targets. After that, this is the most wild bag of wide receivers I can remember talking about in the numerous years that I've been doing this channel. Since five years now, I think I've been doing this channel. Kadarius Tony has all of the movement skills in the world. Kadarius Tony has next level movement skills. Kadarius Tony has Dante Hall level movement skills. Kadarius Tony has movement skills, movement skills, not speed, movement skills that put even Tyreek Hill to shame. Tyreek Hill did not have the wiggle that does Kadarius Tony. Kadarius Tony can't catch a ball. He could. He could the season before last. 
Last season, he couldn't catch a ball. Sky Moore was supposed to be very good at running routes. Was supposed to be. And it seems that all of that little stuff he does is wasted movement and doesn't get him very far on the football field. Sky Moore has had essentially the same two seasons his first two years in the league. Now, not the biggest sin in the world. Kind of stinks to have spent a second round pick on him, but we have gone back on that draft on this channel and looked at the wide receivers that were present, and guys didn't get much better. There's not a whole lot of argument to be had that Sky Moore was George Pickens, basically. That was the one thing that you can be mad about with the Sky Moore pick. The Kansas City Chiefs did not get George Pickens. They got Sky Moore. Okay, yeah, I, I get it. I get it, but wide receiver is very hard. Sky Moore, however, has proven he can be a 250-yard guy. If you want to have seven wide receivers and keep Sky Moore at the seventh spot, okay. Then we have Justin Ross, a guy who has all of the talent in the world, had health issues, which forced him out of the draft. The Kansas City Chiefs took the flyer, took the chance, spent his first season basically redshirting while recovering from a surgery. Last season, had some off-the-field stuff. Didn't have a whole lot of on-the-field stuff. This is, in my opinion, the last hurrah with the Kansas City Chiefs for Justin Ross. Uh, if he does fulfill his potential, guys, I don't know where you put him on the roster. If he is the Justin Ross that we saw in college, those top three are in trouble. And that's just 100% honesty. If he reclaims, if even if he matches his highlights from last preseason, those top three names could be in trouble. And I mean, he has to be consistent with it, right? But if he is consistently that guy, that guy's very good. Nico Remigio. Now, th there's a few more names on the roster. These are the guys that I'm kind of looking at and saying, okay, I think these are the legitimate chances to be on the 53. Nico Remigio was a guy who just made plays. He caught the ball, sold out to make the reception, which is kind of the opposite problem that we have with McColl, right? McColl Hardman is seemingly at times deciding that a ball is not worth selling out for because he cannot run after the catch. Nico Remigio would sell out for the reception and then would not be able to get run after the catch because you're tagged down. So Nico Remigio is this gel glue type of wide receiver that if he can if he can figure out the NFL level this offense becomes unstoppable. Is he Wes Welker? No, he's not Wes Welker. Is he Julian Edelman? No, maybe he's not Julian Edelman. But he's a guy that could consistently get you a third and four conversion. If he can do that, this is a three-peat. I mean, think of how you watched those Patriots teams. You saw all the times that Tom Brady was in third and four, and all they had to do, all, whoever it was, it was the Chiefs, it was the Steelers, it, whoever it was, all they had to do was stop third and four. And some weird little wide receiver you'd never heard of was five yards downfield, got the conversion. You know that feeling. If the Kansas City Chiefs have that guy, guys, if the Kansas City Chiefs have that guy, no one is going to have the patience to play them. So that's the wide receiver spot as I see it now. We get to talk about cornerback, which I haven't done a whole lot on this channel this preseason, so I have a few more notes than the first two spots. Now, obviously, Trent McDuffie's the number one cornerback. Who is the number two? Who is number two working for? Jalen Watson, 
I have made no secret of it, is my pick at the number two spot. Joshua Williams looks like a number three cornerback to me on this roster, but both of those guys are prime candidates to be the starting cornerback opposite of Trent McDuffie. After that, those three names, right? After those three names, this cornerback room is exciting. If you don't know who Kelvin Joseph is, Pull up his Wikipedia. I'll just do it right now. Kelvin Joseph has loads of talent. Kelvin Joseph has not been able to figure it out on the football field yet. Kelvin Joseph, according to Wikipedia, I should have had these ready. 5'11 and a half, basically six foot. 197, okay. 434, 40 yard dash. You're talking about a six foot, two hundred pound man that has a four three four forty, has a one four four ten yard split. I'm sorry, what one four four ten yard split? Yes, a three cone drill of seven two one, a twenty yard short shuttle of four two three, a thirty five inch vertical, and a ten foot eight inch broad jump. Kelvin Joseph. If you were to create a, if you were to take Legarius Sneed's DNA and come up with a an athlete that's just a hair lesser, that's Kelvin Joseph. Now I, I let me. I don't know Legarius Sneed's ten yard split. I highly doubt that it was one four four. One four four is a crazy. Number Legarius needs 40, I think was uh, four, three, yeah, four, three, seven, one, five, one, 10 yard split for Legarius needs four, three, seven, 40 yard dash. So I, I have to pull this up. I should have, I should, I wish I would have thought of this beforehand. I apologize for this. This is on the fly. Xavier Worthy ran the fastest 40 yard dash ever with a one, four, nine, 10 yard split. Unless there was some typographical error, a 144 10 yard split is one of the most insane stats that you will see. Um, one of the most insane numbers that you will see. So that's a guy that can, if you're trusting him to be your number four corner, yeah, man, all day. If it is Trent McDuffie, Jalen Watson, Joshua Williams, and your fourth guy is Kelvin Joseph, with, by the way, the coaching staff the Kansas City Chiefs have that seem to be able to keep making guys reach their potential at the cornerback position, yeah, I'll take it. Miles Battle, by the way, an incredible athlete, a UDFA. I have an entire video on him. This is my choice at UDFA. This is my favorite UDFA that the Kansas City Chiefs signed this run, and that includes... Fabian Levette, of whom we will speak a little bit later. So, I mean, hypothetically, that as a top five, that's a pretty solid corner room. Trent McDuffie, Jalen Watson, Joshua Williams, Kelvin Joseph at number four, an experimental guy like Miles Battle at number five. But that's just for getting last year's cornerbacks. Jamari Connor, who is a part-time cornerback, a nickelback type guy who the, the coaches really seem to like, and Nick Jones, who the coaches sang his praise last season as well, not to mention Scrappy Echo Boido out of Kansas State, who spent most of last season on the practice squad, but ended up getting a little bit of work at the end. Not to mention DJ Miller and Christian Roland Wallace, who were UDFA that could have been drafted. Uh, I think that Christian Roland Wallace, it was his athletic profile that knocked him out, but um, he had some pretty good tape in college, which isn't even to mention Kamal Haddon, this year's number seven, no, seventh round pick, who I'm not going to say he's Legereus Sneed, because that would be hyperbole, that would be silly. And he certainly does not have the speed and the explosion that, that uh, Legereus Sneed had, which was next level. But if you look at his game, he try, his, his game is like 
luxurious Sneeds. And I think that's probably one of the things that they liked about him. So now if we're counting guys who I think all of these guys here um, are legitimate NFL talents, where they are in their development, where they should be on a depth chart. These are different questions. But you're looking at Trent McDuffie, Jalen Watson, Joshua Williams, Kelvin Joseph, Miles Battle, Nick Jones, Jamari Connor, Echo Boydo, DJ Miller, Christian Roland Wallace, and Kamal Haddon. That's 11 names at corner. And that's not all the guys they have. So just wild stuff at corner. Defensive tackle. Chris Jones is likely the starter at defensive tackle one. Obviously, that's sarcasm. Chris Jones is the starter at defensive tackle one. After that, Mike Pinnell is to be kept under a blue tarp until the playoffs. Don't wheel him out there. Just let him sit on the bench and be angry. Because that really worked in last year's postseason run. Derek Noddy is the likely number two defensive tackle. This is not a bad option. It is a low upside option. High medium floor, low ceiling. He is a guy that is going to be able to start at defensive tackle number two. That does not sound like a ringing endorsement. It's not not a ringing endorsement. Defensive tackle is a difficult position in the NFL. Tershawn Wharton is always going to be in the mix. Tershawn Wharton is the Tershawn Wharton is one of the weirdest cases on the entire roster. You look at him and you have no, if you were to look at him, sizing him up, if you got these in there for the, you got these guys in there for the underwear Olympics and you're looking at these athletes, you do not keep Tershawn Wharton on your hypothetical 53 man roster, but you put the pads on. And he's a mean man, right? So he's he's going to factor in. He's going to be in the mix. He has, he has outperformed anything that the Kansas City Chiefs had the right to expect signing Tershawn Wharton out of Missouri Culinary Institute. But then you get into Fabian Levette, who absolutely should have been drafted. I get called out sometimes for saying that he should have been drafted. Well, he maybe he wasn't, though. Yeah. Yeah, but in that seventh round, and in that six, so sixth and seventh round, many teams have two or three picks left in the NFL draft. What are you doing with those two or three picks? You know you have spots on your roster to fill, so you're trying to fill those spots on your roster. You know that certain guys have potential, so you're going to take a couple flyers. You, kn- I shouldn't do this one. Shouldn't do just that one down. And then you know that there are there are high floor guys at positions of value, right? Defensive tackle is a low leverage position. So if there's a guy, so say, just put it in Madden terms because it's easier to talk about, right? If you have a 72 rated offensive tackle, and a 72-rated defensive tackle, you always take the offensive tackle. If you have a 72-rated wide receiver, and you have a 72-rated defensive tackle, these guys are really expensive. Once they hit free agency, you take this guy. You have a 72-rated cornerback, 72-rated defensive tackle. You're always going to take the athlete in that position. So that's how a guy like Fabian Levette ends up falling, 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 and ends up being undrafted. But he is a draft-worthy player. What can he do on this roster? It's going to be interesting to see. And then Alex Gubner is an interesting prospect. Don't know a whole lot about him, but what I could figure out seemed interesting. Now, backup tight end. I've been very vocal about Jared Wiley and thinking that he is going to be the answer at backup tight end. Maybe he's just not ready. Irv Smith was very intriguing when he was signed. Irv Smith is the same kind of guy as Noah Gray. I think that Irv Smith is 
Noah Gray is a more tight end, tight end. Maybe a more H-back tight end. I think that Irv Smith is more of a wide receiver tight end hybrid than a than a tight end H-back hybrid. So they were going to bring slightly different things, but if we're going to go back to Madden terms, I think that they're both like a 73. I think that Jared Wiley could be an 80, 84 type rated player. Garrett, and I'm just, I'm just throwing numbers out there, guys. So don't hold me against Madden when it comes out. Garrett, also, I haven't gamed forever, so don't hold that against me. Garrett Prince. Garrett Prince is interesting. I, I hope that he remains on the Chiefs practice squad this year and they get to figure him out. Baylor Cup is very interesting. The UDFA out of Texas Tech, which always trips me up because he's out of Texas Tech and he's named Baylor, but he's a very big guy. He's a seems to be a, a pretty fast guy. And that would be, I mean, it, you put him on the roster and you got Travis Kelsey at 6'5", you've got Jared Wiley at 6'6", plus, and you have Baylor Cup at 6'6". That's a massive wall of tight end. Pause. That's what I have for this video, but guys, I want to leave you with one other thing today. I don't talk about things outside of the sport of football on this channel because I think that this should be a, a place for football. I think we have strayed as a society, bringing everything into all places. But there's something I want to mention. There is a, a phrase in Chinese. There is a, an idiom, if you will. There is an old cliche. But really, it is more of a curse. If you want to curse someone, you tell them, I hope you live in interesting times. Now, why is this a curse? I hope you live in interesting times. I hope you have an interesting life. Well, no, that's not what it's saying. I hope you live in interesting times because interesting times are very rarely peaceful, and peaceful times are very rarely interesting. If you live in peaceful times, however, you get to make your life interesting. If you live in interesting times, you don't get to dictate things. My friends, I'm afraid that we live in interesting times. And so the last thing that I want to say to you today is keep yourself and your loved ones safe.